we're done with uh, endocrine and we're going to do musculoskeletal, skin, and then CNS, and then we'll have our little slide thing. Musculoskeletal is kind of fun. And I picked out all the key ones that they ask on it. You do know how to have to know how to interpret crystals in the synovial fluid. You do part one and two. In fact, this exact picture is on boards. Okay, we have uh, two diseases, two uh, uh, causes of arthritis that both have uh, uh, crystals in the synovial fluid. One is called uh, gout, and the other one is called um, pseudogout. Now, there are two types of crystals in pseudogout. If you have this, this uh, uh, rhomboid-shaped crystal uh, present in the, in the synovial fluid, I keep on wanting to say spinal fluid, synovial fluid, that's an automatic diagnosis of pseudogout. So that's actually specific. Little chunky crystal, automatically that's pseudogout. The problem is pseudogout can also have needle-shaped crystals, just like monosodium urate. So you've got a problem in differentiating the two. Okay? So what you do is you um, get a sample of synovial fluid. You put a red filter into it. and makes the background red, and it makes the crystals yellow or blue depending upon something depends upon this little analyzer at the base of the microscope. And so in this particular case, I'm going to arrange to put the little analyzer in a north-south direction. Okay, so I got this little thing and I set it north-south. Then what you're supposed to do is, is look at all those crystals that are in the same direction as you just put the analyzer, in this case north-south, and look at what the color is. What color is it? What color is it? Yellow. So when it's yellow and parallel to that analyzer, by definition, that's negatively birefringent, and it's monosodium urate. Okay, now this is a totally different case now. Okay, totally different, totally different. Okay, let's say it's a, it's a knee, okay, and it's, a, it's swollen, an older person. So I'm not really thinking too much gout. I'm wondering about pseudogout. So I, I do it, and I see needle-shaped crystals, okay. And this time I'm going to, uh, just for fun, separate and put it in an east-west direction. East-west direction. I'm going to uh, put that little analyzer. What color is the crystal? Don't look at me. Look it up there. Okay, east-west, what's the color? Blue. When it's blue and parallel to the way you have set the analyzer, that, by definition, is positively birefringent crystal, and it defines pseudogout. So when it's yellow and parallel to your analyzer, it's gout. When it's blue and parallel to the way you've set your analyzer, it's pseudogout. It's extremely simple. This one here is showing the direction that the analyzer was sent, and you can see that it has a blue color, so blue and parallel would have been pseudogout. There you go. Good. Now, we have lots of different types of arthritis. The most common is osteoarthritis. Is that an inflammatory arthritis? No. It's rheumatoid arthritis. Yes. Ankylosing spondylitis. Yes. Good. They got that down. So let's deal with the most common one, osteoarthritis. Okay, now what is it? Osteoarthritis or degenerative arthritis is purely a wearing down of articular cartilage. Guys, everyone in this room is going to wear down their cartilage and their weight-bearing joints to some degree. So we're all going to get a little bit of osteoarthritis, but some will get it a little bit worse because of some genetic uh, tendencies in some cases, okay? And some will not get it too bad, okay? So you're basically wearing down articular cartilage. And if you look over here in this joint, the blue staining stuff is articular cartilage. And I think you can see it's really worn it down quite a bit. In fact, uh, the, the joint space is quite narrow in there, as you can see. So you're constantly wearing it down. And so there's a reaction to injury that occurs at the margin of that joint to this, to this wearing down of the cartilage. And you can see that the reaction to injury has produced a little bit of bone formation right at the edge of the joint, and that's called an osteophyte, or a spur. Okay, and that's just a reaction to injury from this constant wearing down, wearing down of the articular cartilage, okay? So a cook can tell me what the name of that is. What, what term do you call it? That's Heberdeen's note. Okay, now, you know, it's not a lymph node. It's a horrible term to use. It's not a lymph node. What it is is an osteophyte in that joint. That's what that bump is. Okay, that's Heberdeen's node. But it's basically an osteophyte. Uh, this patient also has some, uh, some uh, involvement over here, your uh, interphalangeal joints. And so that's called Bouchard node. And that's also an example of an osteophyte that's doing that. So let's make sure you know the joints. Okay, we're not talking about marijuana here. We're talking about joints. 
What are these? What are your knuckles? Metacarpal phalangeal joints. What, what are the next one? Proximal interphalangeal joints. What's this? Distal and interphalangeal joints. So, in other words, osteoarthritis involves which two? DIP, distal, and PIP. What is rheumatoid arthritis? MCP and PIP. Okay, so where the joints are involved is, is different than the two. They both can involve the proximal interphalangeal joint. Good. Guys, that's all I really have to say about osteoarthritis. There's not much more to say. What's this up on top? Rheumatoid arthritis. You notice the swelling of the what joints? MCP joints. The first one usually is the second one here. Second and third are the ones that usually start off. Now, is this an inflammatory joint disease? Yes. And uh, what is it actually that's setting up the inflammation? It's RH, it's, uh, it's, it's the uh, uh, rheumatoid factor. What is rheumatoid factor? Define it. It's an IgM antibody against IgG. And so what happens, uh, this, uh, these IgM antibodies against IgG are in the synovial fluid. And they form complexes with each other, in a sense form immune complexes which activate the complement system, neutrophils and stuff come in and you start damaging start damaging the joint. And what happens is the synovial tissue starts getting inflamed from all this stuff and starts getting hyperplastic and starts growing and growing and growing and it grows over the articular cartilage and starts destroying that cartilage. What's that, what's that synovial tissue called that's, gro called that's growing over the articular cartilage and panis? Don't confuse that with tophus, please. Tophus is in, is in gout. This is panis. Panis, and basically what it is is synovial tissue that is, that is hyperplastic and, and it is growing over the surface of the articular cartilage and destroying it. And because it is destroying it, it's going to produce as a reaction to injury fibrosis eventually, and so the joints of rheumatoid arthritis can be ankylosed, they can be fixed, they can be so that they don't move. You never had that with osteoarthritis because it's not an inflammatory joint disease. You, you will get fixing of the joint. But if rheumatoids don't keep moving their joints, okay, what, and, and they're not being treated properly with anti-inflammatories, eventually they're going to get ankylosis of the joint and it can't move at all from this disease. Okay? So this picture right here has been very commonly shown on boards because it shows the classic ulnar deviation of the joints that one expects. Notice it's a symmetrical disease. You usually have it in both extremities. And what are these called? Those are rheumatoid nodules. Can you see them in any other disease? Rheumatic fever. Those are the nodules of rheumatic fever. Now sometimes patients with rheumatoid arthritis have uh, usually older patients with rheumatoid arthritis say, Doc, I'm having trouble eating and swallowing crackers. Okay? And it feels like there's sand in my eye all the time. And so you look at their tongue and there it is and what do you see? It's dry, okay? And then you look in their eyes, and it's dry. What's your diagnosis? Sjogren's syndrome. There you go. That's Sjogren's syndrome. That's a, a patient that has rheumatoid arthritis, and then they develop an autoimmune destruction of their lacrimal glands, okay? And the, uh, so what ends up happening is you get keratoconjunctivitis sick, or dry eyes, dry eyes, and so that's why they feel like there's sand in their eyes. And also you destroy the minor salivary glands and you have a dry mouth. Dry eyes, dry mouth, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome. Sjogren's syndrome. Anybody remember the name of the syndrome where you have rheumatoid nodules in the lung along with a pneumoconiosis? Cam, you shouldn't have any problem remembering that. Okay. I think that's all I really need to say about rheumatoid arthritis. Part two is going to ask you how they're now treating the initial disease in most centers, and that's methotrexate. They're not even fiddling around with aspirin anymore or indomethacin. They're going right to the money. Methotrexate, because they find out by hitting them early, they get less severe damage in the long run. So they go the methotrexate route. Okay. So that'd be a great question. You've got a patient with rheumatoid arthritis that develops a microcyt macrocytic anemia with hypersegment and neutrophils. Neurologic exam is normal. What drug is he on? Methotrexate, there you go. See, that's how I would ask that question. Not what drug would you put a patient on rheumatoid arthritis, and that's nothing. Okay, so you give, if you put them on this drug, and you give, a, give some complication of this drug, and then you have to figure out what the drug is. I could also have said interstitial fibrosis in a lung. 
Methyltrexate does that too. <coughs> Hurts, doesn't it? Okay, what's this patient have? Gout. They sometimes call this podagra. Usually the first joint involved in acute gouty arthritis is the big toe. It almost always happens at night. Okay, and what ha what's happening is, is that you're precipitating those monosodium urate crystals in the synovial fluid. The neutrophils are phagocytosing that and release their chemicals, you know, all their enzymes, and that's producing the inflammatory reaction that's going on in this thing, okay? Does an elevated uric acid level automatically mean you have gout? No. I would dare say that probably 25% of people in this room have an elevated uric acid level and you don't have gout. Okay, so what defines gout? Well, you have to have a, uh, a, an inflammatory joint like that and you have had to have stuck a needle into it and documented that there are monosodium urate crystals in it. Now you've diagnosed gout. In fact, there are cases of gout where the uric acid levels are normal. Okay, but the joints have the, have the crystal in them. That's gout. So you don't define gout on the basis of the uric acid level. Now, most of the time they treat the initial disease with an anti-inflammatory agent. Colchicine is out now. It's too toxic. The people get too sick. They don't use that anymore. They use indomethacin most of the time. And, that, and then they control the inflammation. But once they've done that, then what they have to do is decide what caused the gout. So you have to think of two things. Is it an overproduction of uric acid or is it an under-excretion of uric acid? In other words, are they making too much or are they not able to get rid of it in the kidneys? Well, I can tell you over 90% of cases are under-excretion. So if that's true, and it is, and Trevor taught you about drugs that are used in treating gout, we have allopurinol for the overproducers and we have probenicid and what other drug that sounds like an antibiotic, sulfenpyrazone as uricosuric agents. That's it, right? And so if you define that the patient, this, let's say this patient over here was an underproducer, then what would be the drug of choice? Probenicid or sulfenpyrazone. But if it turned out that this patient was an overproducer, which would be uncommon, what would the drug of choice be? Allopurinol. How does that work, please? It blocks exanthine oxidase. That's right. Very good. Now, if you have gout and you don't take care of it real good, it can become chronic. And the sine qua non for the presence of chronic gout is a tophus. A tophus. Now, this is a tophus. That's not a giant malleolus, by the way. Okay, it looks like one, but it ain't. That's a tophus. If that's a giant malleolus, then needs a baby malleoli down here. Okay? Uh, what you would do, if you stuff that with a... Uh, a lance, okay, what would come out? Well, basically crystalline material. And you took a section through it and all that stuff, it'd all polarize, it'd be multinucleated giant cells, a foreign body reaction against it. That's a tophus. That's the deposition of monosodium urate in soft tissue. And this is one of the favorite areas, but also can be seen in the hand, okay, sometimes in the ear. You get these very disfiguring collections of... Uh, of, of monosodium urate and soft tissue. And by the way, it's very destructive when it's next to a joint. It actually erodes away the joint. You get some rip roaring disabling arthritis with this. Once you have a tophus, the only treatment available to you from the henceforth is allopurinol. They don't use any other drug when they get chronic uh, gout or um, something with tophus. Here's an example of a tophus polarized. And all this is is monosodium urate. And here's an example of a tophus that was on a patient's finger. Look what the heck it did to that, to that joint. Look at that, how it eroded it. So it produces a very, very disabling arthritis. Let's see. Genetics, multifactorial inheritance. In other words, a little bit of genetics and a lot of environmental factors. So what would I not want to eat if I, was, if I had gout? Red meats would be bad. Why? Because they're full of purines. Okay? Red wine, very good. What else? Alcohol. Okay? You want to know why alcohol? You want to know why alcohol has a lot of association with gout? Here it is. The answer is this. It's, it's metabolic acidosis. You see, uric acid and all the acids in our body have to compete with each other for excretion in a proximal tubule. And so we already know that in alcoholics, they have lactic acidosis and beta hydroxybutyric ketoacidosis. Agreed? So uric acid is going to have to compete with those two acids for excretion in the proximal tubule. 
And so who's winning? Well, lactic acid and beta hydroxy, there's more of it. So uric acid is waiting and waiting and it's building up, building up, building up, boom. You get that appropriate solubility product, you end up with gout. So it has to do with the ability to get rid of the uric acid uh, from the kidneys uh, and, and having to compete with other acids for excretion. That's the reason for it in, uh, in alcoholics. All right, now this person looks like they're looking down for something, but actually when you talk to them, they'd be turning around to you like this, okay? They turn around like that to you, and they got this hunched over back, which obviously has some great effect on their ability to breathe. It's going to restrict the movement of their chest cavity, and now we're going to have uh, blood gas abnormalities with this. Okay, this patient, uh, when they was young, uh, maybe 20, 21, in the morning when he woke up, he had tremendous pain right back in here. Now, I got pain in my sacroiliac, and little did he know that was a correct, that was correct. And when they did x-rays, there's your sacroiliac, and you see that there's some, there's some inflammatory reaction right where that is. And classically, they wake up in the morning with severe lower back pain right in the sacroiliac, and as the day progresses, they start feeling better. That's just classic. But then eventually what happens is the inflammation also involves the vertebral column, and you get fusion of the, of the vertebral column, so-called bamboo spine. And that's when they start going over like this. Now, un unfortunately, that's not the only part of this disease. I mean, they get this... They're usually, as, as you know, HLA B27 positive. Um, they unfortunately get a couple other things associated with this that have nothing to do with bones. I tried aortitis. They have inflammation of the aorta and commonly have aortic regurgitation. And they commonly have uh, uveitis and, and uh, iridocyclitis with blurry vision and it could potentially go blind. So there's a little bit more than just the, just the arthritic changes in this that you can occur. What's the name of that genetic disease where you can get uh, uh, degenerative arthritis in the vertebral column and other places, and if you did an autopsy, you'd see that the, uh, the, vertebra, the cartilage in between the vertebrae was a black color. You can have these patients urinate, and then you expose it to sunlight, and you see right before your eyes it turned black. That's how captainuria, okay, autosomal recessive disease, homogentizate oxidase, is absent, and so there's a buildup of homogentic acid, and on exposure to light, it turns black, and when it, when it deposits into, into your uh, cartilages, it absolutely destroys them. And you get this black pigment in there. That's an absolute favorite question on boards because it's got a biochemistry, can't tell you. Okay, now here's a guy. That was a bad boy. He ended up with dysuria. It increased frequency. He did a your analysis, he had lots of neutrophils, but you couldn't really see any bacteria at all. His leukocyte esterase was positive, but his, his nitrite was negative, and you cultured the urine, there was nothing in it. So in a sense, that's sterile pyuria, isn't it? And finally, you woke up and said, are you sexually active? Yeah. Okay, when was your last sex contact? Oh, last week. Non-specific urethritis, chlamydia. And then this guy gets treated for his chlamydia, and then about two, a couple of weeks later, he starts getting a sterile conjunctivitis, and he's starting to get some pain back down here, and right at his Achilles tendon, right down there, it's hurting like the devil. Now what does he have? Ryder syndrome. So this guy's actually B27 positive, and what was his environmental trigger that pushed him into developing ankylosing spondylitis, chlamydia, which is the most common one of all. This is a sterile conjunctivitis. This is not a chlamydia conjunctivitis. And that thing I told you about the Achilles tendon was on part one. Okay, that's they get an Achilles tendonitis. Right where the Achilles tendon inserts into the calcaneus, right there, there's an inflammatory reaction. It's absolutely pathic mnemonic for Ryder syndrome. Believe it or not, it was on part one. I mean, I can see that for part two, but they put it on part one. Okay. Why am I showing an ulcerative colitis over here in all of this uh, business of ankylosing spondylitis? Because that can be an environmental figure, uh, 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 thing in a patient that's actually B27 positive and pushing them into an ankylosing spondylitis. So there's a lot of different things. Psoriasis, uh, chlamydia, ulcerative colitis, shigella, lots of different things can push you into 
ankylosing spondylitis if you're HLA B27 positive. It can occur in women too. Not as common, but you can see it in women too. Okay, this was a very bad boy. Okay, got a hot joint. That's his knee. It's got this pustule on his palm. Let's aspirate it. So we aspirate that pustule. And we see gram-negative diplococci in those neutrophils. What does this patient have? Disseminated gonococcemia. Disseminated gonococcemia. I want you to remember STD, sexually transmitted disease. It summarizes what you see in it. S means that you have a synovitis. And so in other words, they get inflammation of the... Of the uh, of joints, and specifically uh, the knees, the big joint. T stands for tenosynovitis. That's uh, the, in the joints in the, in the uh, hands and in the feet. And then that's the STD. D means dermatitis. That's the pustules that they get also near their hands and feet. And very commonly, if you aspirate them, you can see the GC right in them. Does anyone happen to remember from the immunology lectures what would really help predispose you? Let's say you did get GC. Okay, not everyone's going to get disseminated disease, but what if, what complement components, if you were missing these complement components, you'd be absolutely guaranteed in going disseminated? C5 through C9. In other words, that final common pathway. Okay, C5, read some people say C6, who cares? It's the final common pathway. And the reason for that is, you need those complement components to phagocytose Nigeria gonorrhea. So if you're deficient in them, and then you did get GC. In other words, you're not getting it just because you're deficient in that. I mean, you, you got it from other things. And you happen to be negative for those complement components. You'll, get, you'll disseminate. You'll get disseminated disease. I hate to tell you this, but the most common cause of septic arthritis in the United States is gonorrhea. Mm -hmm. GC. And it'll be in the knee. Well, here we got a watermelon pit that's walking. Okay, so we got a walking watermelon pit. But this little watermelon pit bit this dude right there. And then it looks like you dropped a pebble in the water and you had these concentric circles going out. Like you'd see if you dropped a pebble in the water. Who could put that together for me? Well, that's erythema chronica migrans, right? And what does this patient have? Lyme's disease. Organism. Borrelia burgdorferi. Tick, Ox Ioxides tick. Okay, very good. This is pathognomonic of Lyme's disease. You see it, you treat them. You treat them with uh, tetracycline. If you don't treat them, okay, and you miss this, and they go on into the chronic stages, then you're going to have a problem. Now, the disabling joint disease is nothing compared to the other things you get, like myocarditis. And listen, pearl for you, pearl. Any patient. Any patient, you know, we're in Lyme's disease country. I mean, Connecticut ain't too far from here. Long Island, Long Island, don't walk, don't walk in the woods in Long Island. You're guaranteed to get ioxidase ticks on you. You all know that, okay? Big time problem. Um, bilateral Bell's palsy. Usually idiopathic Bell's palsy is due to herpes simplex. Usually, not always. And it's unilateral. When it's bilateral, it's Lyme's disease and to prove it otherwise because the most common cranial nerve involved in chronic Lyme's disease is the seventh nerve. Okay, that's literally pathognomonic. Bilateral Bell's palsy. and idiopathic Bell's palsy, it's only one side. When it's both sides, you're talking about Lyme's disease. Now I'm going to trick you. You ready? Let's see how well you were taught microbiology. Let's say this person developed a hemolytic anemia. And you looked at the peripheral blood and you saw something abnormal. What did you see? Babesia microtii. Remember, this tick, Ioxides damini, actually has a reservoir for the Borrelia burgdorferi, and that's the white-tailed deer. Also, the white-tailed deer has Babesia in it. And so this tick carries, can carry two diseases, Borrelia burgdorferi producing lines, and the BCR microtii, which is an intraerythrocytic parasite that produces a hemolytic anemia. Looks very similar to the ring form that you saw of plasmodium falciparum. So you can get both. In fact, I read that 20% of people with Lyme's disease have the BCosis as well. 
So you want to remember that, that this, this, this tick is carrying two diseases with it. And if one of them, the patient has a hemolytic anemia, you know what the answer is, babesiosis. Very common, guys, so perfect board question, in my opinion. If you have chronic disease, you treat them with ceftriaxone. When they have the early form, you treat them with tetracycline. Both have been asked on part one. <sighs> this exact picture has been on so many boards, but a second-year medical student thinks it's a foreign body in the eye. And most of them think, hey, this place must have been playing horseshoes and got it in the eye. I think maybe not, because if they were, then they were miniature people that were playing this. And they completely missed the fact that there's a bluish discoloration to the sclera. And they completely missed osteogenesis imperfecta. Okay, this is the picture that is shown on all boards on osteogenesis imperfecta. But they know that you know that there's a picture out there on osteogenesis imperfecta. So they've gone a step further. They're not going to say, what is it? That's an idiot question. They're going to ask you, what's the defect? The answer, what's the defect? They can't make type 1 collagen. That's one thing, but they ask you type 1 collagen. They cannot make that. It's defective synthesis of type 1 collagen. You know what they asked? What's the mechanism of the blue sclera? <laughs> Well, those of you that are a little bit light-skinned, look at your forearm. What's the color of your veins underneath your skin? Blue. Okay. Well, what's this called? Sclera, right? Well, there's collagen in sclera. And since, you have, since your type 1 collagen is defective, then it's thin, isn't it? And so, therefore, what you're seeing is it's so thin there because you don't have collagen there, you're seeing the underlying choroidal veins. And so basically, it's the reflection of the veins underneath there, the choroidal veins, that gives the blue color to the sclera. It had nothing to do with any discoloration of it. It's just showing the veins underneath. Just like your veins are blue, look through your skin. They look blue through your sclera. That's thin. Clever, isn't it? Where do you think I found that out? Oh, I had to look for that one. I had to look for that one. I wasn't about to let that one go. Okay, because certainly Robbins didn't have that. Okay, and a lot of internal medicine books didn't have it either. I forget actually where I did find it. It might have been Nelson's the textbook in Pisa. I'm not exactly sure, but it is a correct fact. So they even ask that because they know that you know that this picture's there. They show a kid with an eyeball. I'll tell you it's defective. Now there's a disease called osteopetrosis which is a defect in osteoclasts, which, so you can't break bone down, and so yeah, it's called brittle bone disease. And so what happens there is that if you can't break bone down, you have no marrow. Okay, so you have severe anemias and different nerves and crap like that get caught in there, and that's called brittle bone disease. So that's a defect in osteoclasts. And sometimes they try to pass that off as osteogenesis imperfecta which is a defect in making type 1 collagen, not a defect in osteoclasts. That's osteopetrosis. That's your uh, articular cartilage there, and not, not articular, the cartilage in there between your vertebral column. Is that a normal width? No. It's kind of thin, don't you think? What's this hump called? Moon, huh? Moon? No. That's a dowager's hump in a patient with osteoporosis. Osteoporosis. What's the mechanism of osteoporosis in the elderly woman? You're breaking more bone down than you're putting in. And the reason why you're breaking more bone down than putting in is that you don't have enough estrogen to inhibit interleukin-1, osteoclast activating factor, from breaking your bone down. Osteoporosis is an overall reduction in bone mass. That's both the mineral and organic component of bone. Osteomalacia is, a, is de decreased mineralization. The organic part of the bone is totally normal. Cartilage is okay. Osteoid is okay. It's just that you're not mineralizing it. Osteoporosis, both of them are decreased. The mineral content and the organic compound. So the whole mass of the bone is decreased. You diagnose it with dual beam for, uh, what do they call it? Dual beam absorptiometry. And they measure the density of bone in different areas of the body, somewhere around the hand area. And they can tell what the density of bone is. That's the, it's a non-invasive test, very easy to do. 
Now, the most common fraction you're looking at, fracture you're looking at, the compression fractures, you literally are collapsing in your vertebral column. And you will lose stature. You, if you were a five foot two, you're going to be four foot nine. Okay, with this thing. And basically, the very weight of your head is causing you to lean forward like that and your back to go out because of the weakness of the bone there. The second most common fracture is the Collie's fracture of the distal radius. Okay. Is swimming a good exercise to prevent osteoporosis? No. Why? No stress on bone. That's a board question. Oh, it's a great exercise for aerobics. I'm not saying it's not good for that. But because the water is basically holding you up and taking off the stress off of you, it's a horrible thing for preventing osteoporosis. So you have to stress bone to build it up. That's why they recommend walking. They actually found out that actually if a woman will do weight training, uh, weight training using weights, that's even better than walking. Because that even puts a greater stress on it. So if I were a woman, which I'm not, I would walk with some dumbbells in my hand, and I'd be moving those little suckers, maybe put some, put some little weights on, your, on there and get that extra weight and walking so you get your aerobics and your bone mass increased. Remember, the biggest problem in space is a lack of gravity and osteoporosis. That's why they carry ast astronauts off the spaceships, because they don't want them walking because they had serious osteoporosis after they'd been in space, and they have to give them bisphosphonates and, and calcium and, and uh, all those different things, vitamin D, uh, to before they get their density back. So they haven't figured out how to get around uh, preventing osteoporosis in space. Okay. By the way, you know what you women should be on now, even if you're not uh, uh, postmenopausal? Okay, you need to exercise and do the things that I just said, too. You need uh, 1,500 milligrams of calcium every day, and you need 400 to 800 units of vitamin D every day. Also, you need a vitamin pill that contains iron. Those are all normal primary prevention things that every young woman in a reproductive period of life should be doing. Okay. Good. We're done with that couple bone tumors. I don't ask a whole lot on bone tumors. I'm going to show you the two most common cartilaginous ones. Then I'm going to show you the one that's uh, uh, involving bone. This actually is the overall most common bone tumor right here. And you ever see people that have these little knobby excrescences? So maybe let's say over here and you have this big knob there and you can feel that it's bone. That's called an uh, uh, osteochondroma. Okay, and what that is, is a little overgrowth, it's a neoplasm of cartilage, and it's a little overgrowth of cartilage, and it's capped by, by, uh, uh, by bone on the surface. So it's a little overgrowth of, of cartilage. Some people call them exostoses. Uh, that's what that is. If you, unfortunately, have Oliers disease, and you've got these all over your body, uh, you are run a risk for developing chondral sarcoma. So this little increase in, in, uh, in, uh, in cartilage capped by a little bit of bone, those are the most common overall bone tumor. This is the most common malignant one. This is called a chondral sarcoma. Okay. You already saw this. Okay, this is osteogenic sarcoma. Always think the knee area with this one, distal femur, proximal tibia, adolescent. So they talk about bone pain down here, the knee area there, and a young adolescent, or maybe early 20s, always think osteogenic sarcoma. Okay, and let's look at this one. Notice that it develops in a metaphysis of bone. Notice that it is invaded up into the muscle, went through the periosteum. You can see a little bit of a, of a lifting of the periosteum here, so on an x-ray that would look like a triangle. Okay, now this happens to be in the shoulder of this particular one, so there's always exceptions to the rule. And you can see this, you see these little spicules of bone there? That's called the sunburst appearance. So sunburst appearance, Cotman triangle, Knee area, adolescent, osteogenic sarcoma. Anybody remember the suppressor gene relationship? RB suppressor gene chromosome? 13. Very good. Now, this little poor little dude over here on your left is not practicing for track. This little dude looks like he's got a pretty good set of calves there, except it's pseudohypertrophy. It's actually fat. And why, the reason why this poor little kid is doing this is he's climbing up on his legs to stand up. 
Okay, it's called Gower's Maneuver. This little kid has an elevated CMCK, and he has an absence of a certain protein, name me, dystrophin. What does he have? Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Genetics, sex-linked recessive. Missing what? Dystrophin. Just remember, dystrophy, dystrophin. Okay, but they went beyond that on this. They looked at this and they said there's a variant of this disease, okay, and they wanted to know what the mechanism of that was. Of course, the variant is Becker's dystrophy. It's still sexually recessive, and what's the difference? Oh, they make death dystrophin, but it's abnormal dystrophin. So there's no dystrophin in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, and they do make dystrophin in Becker's, but it's defective. They asked it, guys, and so you got to play the game. There's an analogy to this if you're interested, and that's alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Some of you that are into pediatrics know that the most common cause of hepatocellular carcinoma in children is alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Okay, and yet you also know that adults get pain, and emphysema, and it doesn't, doesn't, you know, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't make any sense. Well, the answer to this is, is as follows. There's many different subtypes of alpha-1 antitrypsin. There's a type where you don't make alpha-1 antitrypsin at all. In that case, you will end up as a young adult with panacea and emphysema. There's another type, however, where you do make alpha-1 antitrypsin, but you can't get it out of your hepatocytes. And when you do PAS stains, of the hepatocytes in these kids, you see lots and lots and lots of alpha-1 antitrypsin, except it can't get out of the hepatocyte. And so it damages the hepatocyte and predisposes the hepatocellular carcinoma. Is that not a little bit analogous to what we just said about Duchesne's versus Becker's? In Becker's, you don't make dystrophin. And the one that has pain, acid, or emphysema, you don't make alpha-1 antitrypsin. Right? I mean, uh, uh, I say, did I say my muscular dystrophy? You don't make, this, uh, in, in Duchenne's, you don't make dystrophin, whereas the uh, pain, acid, or emphysema, you don't make alpha-1 antitrypsin. Okay? In the kids that have cirrhosis related to alpha-1 antitrypsin, they make it, but it's defective. In Decker's, they make dystrophin, but it's defective. There's an analogy there. And so if you can remember one of those, then you'll be able to remember that link on the other one, and you'll end up with three or four questions right. That's pretty cool. Let's break. <clears throat> okay, let's start up. Let's start up. How about that one? You like that one, huh? Matches my brain, doesn't it? All right, this is how most of you looked when I walked into the room. <laughs> Actually, we shouldn't make fun of disease, but this is myotonic dystrophy, which is the most common adult muscular dystrophy. It's autosomal dominant. And it's an example of something that our, <clears throat> I think that uh, Rauschenbach, Reichenbach, whatever it is his name is, will talk to you about, and that's called a triplet repeat disease. That's where you get re repetition of trinucleotides. Okay, so let's say it was CAG. Let's say that was the, tri the, uh, the trinucleotide, and you just repeat it one right after the next. The same thing, CAG, 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 CAG. This keeps on repeating itself. That's called triplet repeats. And there are about four diseases that have that abnormality. They include Huntington's chorea, they include myotonic dystrophy, Friedrich's ataxia, and fragile X syndrome, okay, where you have mental retardation and macroorchidism, big testicles, usually uh, when they're adolescents. And they all have these, uh, these triplet repeats of the trinucleotide. It has a concept associated with it, and that in future generations, the disease gets worse. That's called anticipation. In other words, you can anticipate 
that in, in, in your future generations of kin, that the disease is going to get worse. And the reason for that is, is that for each time, each generation is more of those triplet repeats added on. And so you're coding for an even more defective protein. And so the disease gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. The way they ask the board question, to my knowledge, is that a counselor, genetic counselor, is, is uh, telling these two, um, uh, this couple, uh, that they, they had a, a, a type of disease that if they were to have children then, that the disease would invariably be fatal in their children. Okay? Then it said that they didn't listen to their counselor, and they had a child that lasted only one month and died. And so they asked what it was, and it was, uh, or they asked what was this an example of uh, a triplet repeat disorder, because they were coming in, probably one of those future generations had some kind of, had a, had a, tri a triplet repeat type of thing, which is going to get worse, and so this guy is saying, now, you know, don't get pregnant because you're, you know, you're many generations ahead here. Chances are the baby would be very, very abnormal based on the fact of what disease you have, okay? And they didn't listen, and the, and the baby and the baby died. So that's the way they asked that particular question. So that's called anticipation, and the, the defect is called triplet repeats. Myotonic dystrophy is an example. Now, this has frontal balding, but that doesn't mean anything. This guy, unfortunately, has muscle weakness in his face, and that's why his mouth is drooped open. And that's how you usually see the teenagers. They usually start with, of course, most teenagers have their mouth like this. You know, Joey, what did you learn in school? <laughs> They all look like they have myotonic dystrophy, you know. But uh, <laughs> you can tell I really don't like teenagers. And, um, and so that's how they usually start. But somebody was pretty clever on the boards and said that, uh, I think they actually had this picture up there, and they said this guy couldn't release his hand, his grip on his golf stick. That's the way they worded this thing. That's the uh, myotonic part of it. They have failure. Uh, they can't relax their muscle grip. So they're the kind of people that if you hand grip them, you know, you're going to have to pry it off with some kind of with your foot. You know, <laughs> okay, because they're going to keep on gripping. They can't release uh, the uh, the grip on your on your hand. That's a characteristic. They also have uh, diabetes. They also have. Uh, a, a cardiac abnormality as well. So it's a, it's a kind of a real group of syndromes. Myotonic dystrophy. Triple repeat. Anticipation are the key words you want to remember. Now, most of you end up like this towards the end of the day. <laughs> then I kind of scream a little bit and your eyes open a little bit and find, make sure there's no fire or anything like that. And everything's doing fine, you know. And then it goes down again. Okay. But uh, actually, she was like this uh, when she was in the neurologist's office, and then he did something, he injected something, and the next thing you know, her eyes opened and she felt a lot better, which is diagnosis, myasthenia gravis. This is an autoantibody against acetylcholine receptor. It's an IgG antibody, and so that's an example of type 2 hypersensitivity, as is Graves' disease, which is an IgG uh, antibody against the receptor. That by definition, makes it type 2. Uh, whether you destroy the receptor or just block it is irrelevant. Acetylcholine can hook into it, and so you're going to get muscle weakness. The first muscles usually are the lids, and so they get lid lag, and they also get double vision because the muscles of the eye are also screwed up, and they get diplopia. Then eventually they get to stage her for solids and liquids, and they'll say, I, I can't swallow, and they'll point right here that it's stuck right there. And uh, that's because that's striated muscle up there, and this disease is affecting primarily striated, not smooth muscle. And then eventually the muscle weakness progresses all around. It's a very bad disease. I had it not, I, my, it wasn't my secretary, but it was one in our department area. And she had it and actually made the diagnosis. I made the diagnosis because I noticed at the end of the day, that she's just dragging around, and I said, your, your, your lids are dragging. I said, do you know that? She says, yeah, I noticed my, I can't keep my eyes open. And I said, I said uh, how's your vision? Right? Sometimes I get a little double vision. So. And she said, I just got back from the doctor, and the doctor I said, I couldn't swallow. I couldn't swallow. And he said, well, you have globus hystericus. That's a terrible thing to say. What an idiot that doctor was. At any rate... Uh, uh, I say, well, what about when you wake up in the morning? Feel great. Then what happens is the day progresses, feel bad. I said, can I suggest that you go to a neurologist? Okay. 
And so she did, and he did a 10 small test on her, positive, got reset the antibodies, they were positive, and made the diagnosis that she's not doing well. Here's a young lady, 32 years old, two kids, that is disabled. She's actually got disability insurance. And she's probably going to die because what happens is when all the receptors go, you can give all the acetylcholine esterase inhibitors you want. That's the treatment. By giving an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, you block the breakdown of acetylcholine, so you really build up that acetylcholine level in there. And so what few receptors you may have, you have a much greater chance of them hooking into it, that there's more acetylcholine there, and so they do well. But eventually, when there's no receptors, it doesn't really matter how much acetylcholine is in there, you're screwed. So then her only option would be actually, um, and probably wouldn't do much good, as a thymectomy. So let's talk about the thymus as in the anterior uh, mediastinum, as you know. And a trick question is, what's the pathology? They could describe this. You know it's myasthenia gravis. And they can say, what would you expect to see in the thymus of this patient? And you're going to put thymoma down, and you could be wrong. Now, thymoma is a, is a malignancy of the thymus, but that only occurs in 15 to 20 percent of cases. What you actually see are germinal follicles in the thymus. That's T cell country. What's B cells doing there? They're the ones making the antibody. So the antibody is not made in your lymph nodes. The antibody is made in the stinking germinal follicles in your thymus. And so you can see why, doing a thymectomy, you're removing the antibody-producing tissue. And actually, one-third of people get complete cure, one-third get partial cure, and one-third and one -third don't go to any. And those are the ones probably that waited too long, okay, and they didn't have any receptors anyway. Okay, so that's the, that's the, that's the myasthenia story. So don't pick thymoma is the most common uh, thing that you see. It's B-cell hyperplasia is the most common thing you see in the thymus, okay? And that's where the antibody is being made. Myasthenia gravis. Okay, let's do some uh, collagen vascular disease. You all know this is a butterfly distribution of, of a rash on the face, but you now you can see that in eczema and all that stuff, so don't jump on that all the time. It could be just an excess amount of rouge on your face, too. Okay, you see these people, they're just kind of really dressing themselves up there, and you say, hey, do you know they got lupus? No, I don't. <laughs> okay. Just a couple key points on lupus. Uh, uh, of all the autoimmune diseases, it's the one that would most likely have a positive ANA. As a matter of fact, it's about 99% sensitivity. The two antibodies that you want to order when you have a positive ANA to prove that it's lupus, not something else, are any Smith antibody which has 100% specificity for lupus. I hope you know what that means. That means if I did an anti-Smith antibody in this room, and one of you had a positive test, you have lupus. I don't even have to ask you any questions. I don't have to get a family history, you've got lupus. Because if it has 100% specificity, that means no false positives. So if it means if it has no false positives, and if it's positive, then obviously it's true. So it has 100% positive predictive value. The other one you get is anti-double-stranded DNA. And if that's positive, it not only means you have lupus, but it also means you have kidney disease as well. And that has about like a 98% uh, specificity and, and, um, uh, uh, as well. So that's why those are two good uh, antibodies to confirm the diagnosis of lupus. Morning stiffness is present in lupus. It, sim it simulates rheumatoid arthritis photophobia, the Malar rash, uh, what else? They get the pericarditis, uh, all of these things one sees. This is an LE cell. Never order an LE cell prep. They're an absolute unequivocal waste of time. What they are is the uh, antibodies, anti-DNA antibodies, react against uh, DNA. And then the, what happens is the neutrophil phagocytizes those cells. And this is the DNA uh, in there. So it's a neutrophil and it's phagocytose. Uh, altered DNA. That's called an LE cell. It takes a long time to look for these, and it's not even specific for lupus. It's an absolute, total waste of time. So never order an LE prep. You will be hated by the laboratory. You will, you will have to change your name, okay, okay, because they will hate you for doing that. It's just a curiosity now, okay. What's this patient have? 
It's got a very tight face. It's got some telangiectasia. She's got dysphagia for solids and liquids. She's got a classic Raynaud's phenomenon. You x-ray her hand, she's got dystrophic calcification all over the stinking place. She's got scleral dactyly. What's she got? Progressive systemic sclerosis. Or she actually could have Crest syndrome. You just have to, uh, have to just find out which organs are involved. If kidneys are involved, which is very, very common, it progresses to systemic sclerosis, and that would be a Crest syndrome doesn't involve the kidneys. Okay, so sometimes it's a, it's, a, it's a tough diagnosis to make which one it is, but irrespective, they're both bad. They're both bad diseases. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say on, on that. Okay, here's a patient that you've seen this one already. Remember, dermatomyositis with the raccoon eyes? Okay, uh, this is where they have elevated serum CKs. This one doesn't show it quite as well, the raccoon eyes, but it does show this little rash, not very good, that you see right over the, uh, the proximal endophalangeal joints. It's kind of like a silvery rash that's called Goldtrans patches, uh, and this is dermatomyositis. This is the one that has the highest association with an underlying cancer. Okay. We already talked about Sjogren's syndrome in the context of rheumatoid arthritis and antibodies that destroy minor salivary glands, dry mouth, uh, and lacrimal glands, dry eyes. This is a biopsy of the lower lip, which is the confirmatory test, I might add, looking to see if there's an inflammatory reaction destroying the minor salivary glands, and you can see all these lymphocytes there. That would be considered confirmatory diagnosis. Sjogren's syndrome. The antibodies are anti-SSA, anti-SSB, and it took me years. I said, what do I want the SSS stands for? This shows you how dumb I am sometimes. I mean, sometimes I may sound really smart, but I talk about dumb. Finally, it dawned on me that SS stood for Sjogren's Syndrome. <laughs> I just, just couldn't believe it. They have another name for them now. Anti-SS, uh, A is anti-Rho, and anti-SSB is called La, and that came after the Sound of Music movie, so, a small female deer, la, so they decided, let's change SSA to anti-rho, and then SSB to anti-la. Anybody know something else about anti-rho antibodies? Patients with lupus can have this antibody too, and it can cross the placenta and attack the baby's conduction system. Okay, so patients uh, with lupus that have that particular antibody, SSA or anti-rho, uh, there's an IgG antibody, and it can cross the placenta, and for some crazy reason, it attacks the conduction system of the baby, and you got a baby with uh, complete heart block. On occasion, that's asked on part one, a little bit more commonly on part two, actually. I'm only going to show you a couple skin zits, guys, because uh, part two is the skin zit test. <laughs> okay, a zit is, you know, lesion in the skin, or a pimple. I'm going to show you the classic ones that I think are part one worthy. And you've seen quite a few already. I showed you basal cell carcinoma, so I don't think I have to show you another one of those. Okay, even though what histologically it looks like, I've shown you squamous cell carcinoma, okay, lower lip, and that little thing, on the, I've shown you actinic keratosis, so you're aware of that lesion, and you rub it off and it comes back. I've showed you even psoriasis. And so that's a silvery uh, uh, you know, lesion that's red and raised and has a silvery plaque. Someone was asked, saying something about on, on her exam that there was this rash on the hands that had a silvery look to it. That was psoriasis involving the hands. It doesn't always just involve the, uh, the pressure points. And it actually involved the scalp. In fact, that's the most common location. People think they have, they have uh, um, dandruff, which is seborrheic dermatitis due to malassezia furfra. Uh, but in reality, it's psoriasis, okay? Now, in one exam, I might mention on the psoriasis, it was a black person with psoriasis. So obviously, you're not going to see that reddish discoloration, but what's really going to stand out is uh, silvery, uh, the silvery thing. But a lot of people missed it, okay? They just put, I don't know what the heck they would have put down on it, but if it's, you see a rash on the elbow, I mean, that's the classic pressure point area. I don't care if it's a Martian, a black person, white person, Far Eastern person, whatever person. It's psoriasis. It, it doesn't change the diagnosis. Guys, this is atopic dermatitis on this little child's face. This is how a kid with an allergic diathesis usually starts their disease. I'm really familiar with this. All my grandchildren got this. 
And so they get this eczema, or what they call atopic dermatitis. You can see this kid's mouth is open, probably as a mouth breather. It's type 1 hypersensitivity. This is a contact dermatitis. And this is another, the reason why they left the girdle on this woman. And that's because the contact dermatitis was to the metal in there, and that was probably nickel, which is a very, very uh, uh, substance that commonly develop a reaction. It is a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. Now listen carefully. Listen carefully. This is how they ask these kinds of questions. They can say, they can show you this, and they say, the pathophysiology of this lesion would be equivalent to the pathophysiology of, pathophysiology of which is the following. And then they'll say wheel and flare reaction in someone with a scratch test, and they'll put all other crap down there. And then they'll put, say, positive PPD. That's the answer. Because this is type 4 hypersensitivity, and so is a positive PPD, type 4 hypersensitivity. They're pretty clever. They got two for one by that. You get two for one by that one. You have to know what this is, first of all. You got to know it's type 4 hypersensitivity. Then you got to know another disease that's type 4 hypersensitivity. <laughs> pretty clever. Pretty clever. Those guys are smart, but not smarter than you. <laughs> I don't think I agree with you, Dr. Gallion. <laughs> You've got a trumped up idea about how smart I am. Well, all right. This is seborrheic dermatitis. That's due to my... What a wonderful name for a fungus. Don't you think this would be a great name for your kid? Malassezia for, for Golion. It's got a nice... <laughs> it's just... Uh, uh, Goljan. Goljan now. What a wonderful name. I mean, how many people out there in the general public know that Malassezia purpura is a fungus? Not a whole lot. You know, then you get a whole lot of other people, and then you start a little Malassezia purpura cult, you know, and you got this whole conclave of people, and they meet every year, and you know, then all of a sudden they get the bad news from a, a mycologist that, you know, you're named after a fungus, and then all of a sudden these people are all in, you know, intensive psychotherapy. Okay, and they have issues against their parents and stuff like that, if you know what I mean. It could really be a downhill thing. So, guys, this is in an adult. And I just finished telling you it's Malosacea furfur. Are you worried about this since it seems to be pretty expensive? Well, I would. I think about an immunocompromised disease, and this patient actually has AIDS. Ooh. So you're saying that disseminated cerebriac dermatitis due to malassezia furfur, is kind of a pre-AIDS, maybe defining lesion. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yep. Now, here's a patient who's got this bald spot on their head. And so you use a black light, which remember is UVA light, and it fluoresces. What's your diagnosis? Microsporum canis, which used to be the most common cause of tinea capitis. But actually now, it's trichophyton conturans is the most common one. And because the fungus involves the inner portion of the shaft, there's no fluorescent metabolites. It's, it's, a, it's a woods light negative. So remember, the most common cause of uh, tinea capitis, you know, superficial dermatophytes, I'm sure you understand what I'm saying, is not microsporum canis anymore. It's trichophyton conturans. But I got really good news for you. This is going to be so cool. All the other superficial dermatophyte infections, including tinea corporis, which is what this is. You can see why they called it ringworm. If it was, it was a really dumb one because it kept going around in circles, kind of like a guy when he's trying to, you know, find directions. He ends up going to the same spot. They thought this was a worm going under here, okay? But, of course, it's a superficial dermatophyte infection. It's not a worm, even though they call it ringworm. So if you see kind of something like this with a red outer edge and a clear center, and they ask you what's your first step in the workup, the answer is to scrape the outside, do a KOH prep, which is this, and you see the hyphae and you see the yeast forms on that. All other superficial dermatophyte infections except tinea capitis are due to trichophyton rubrum. That's cool. That's cool because it is not a whole lot to remember. The way you're going to remember that, what color is that right there around that, that, uh, that uh, tinea corpus? What's the color? Red. What's rubrum mean? Red. That way you remember. Trichophyton rubrum. They like molluscum contagiosum, guys. It's a very, very common infection in children. When they see these things, they kind of pick at them. 
because they kind of have sandy-like material in the middle of this crater. Then they, they self-inoculate, and they get these things over and over and over again. It can last for quite a while. Anybody remember the name of the virus producing these? Pox virus. Okay, pox virus. So it's a, it's a DNA virus, actually, and it's, this is very, very common, molluscum contagiosum. Remember how, how the basal cell carcinomas were crateriform, kind of like a volcano-like thing? Just take that same kind of look, that volcano crater reform type of thing, and put it on the skin of a kid, and it's got sandy stuff in it, that's molluscum contagiosum. That's a viral infection. All right, now this is an inner and nice smile over here by this person. Uh, let's say this patient came in to you, and said, I got this rash right on my butt. And okay, he said, how did you know it was there? That's always an interesting question to ask. Okay, how did you do that? Did you have look backwards like that and all that? I mean, why are you looking at your butt for rashes to begin with? Okay. But anyway, here's this non-paritic rash, okay, because it could be, you know, a little consult to a psychiatrist in this patient. And so we got this oblong-looking thing with red on the outside, pale in the middle. You say, nah, this is tinea corpus, but it is kind of oblong-looking as opposed to circular. But you go ahead and you do a KOH prep anyway, because that's what Dr. Goyon said you should do. So you scratch. Nothing. Nothing. So what do you always do when you don't know what a skin's it is? Topical steroids. And so you put topical steroids, and it didn't go away. And about three days later, the dude comes back, and he's got this rash in the lines of Langer and a Christmas tree distribution on his trunk, which he diagnoses pedoriasis. Rosia. You better know that one. It's not an infectious disease. This is a herald patch. This was kind of like a herald that hark the herald angels sing, a rash is about to come. Okay? So it has a lot of Christmassy things to it. Herald, Christmas tree, I mean, good Lord, common, 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 common board question. Okay? It is not a fungus. It is not a fungus. It's called Pteroriasis rosia. Okay, now this is a precursor lesion for malignant melanoma. If you have more than a hundred of these nevi on your body, you have the dysplastic nevus syndrome. And it's very, very common. You see lots of people, they just have these brown jobbies all over their butt. My son's wife has got these suckers all over her. She's got dysplastic nevus syndrome. You have to go to a qualified dermatologist once a year to have your whole body looked at. Because what they're looking for is one of these dysplastic nevi. Notice it's a little bit irregular. It's got some difference, a uh, little color differentiation, and it could be a precursor lesion for malignant melanoma. Dysplastic nevus. Very, very, very common. These are all the different variations of malignant melanoma. There's at least four different types. You've already seen this one. Part two would say, when they saw one of these, they'd say, what's your first step in management? The answer is excision. It's not punch biopsy. It's not partial incision. It's excision. You remove the whole thing. This happens to be a superficial spreading malignant melanoma, which is the most common one. This is the one that you see commonly on older people, and it's always on the face. You see these very commonly, kind of fawn-colored, lesions with irregular borders. Those are lentigo malignant melanoma. Of all the melanomas, that's the one that's the least likely to metastasize. And you see it on the face area. So that's a sun-exposed area, as you can see. Now, this is the killer right there. That's the killer. It's saying, I mean, that? Uh-huh. Yeah, that. Now, you know that the black population don't get malignant melanomas because the pigment in the skin prevents ultraviolet light damage and the propensity for cancers, but there is one type of malignant melanoma they can get. So here's your board question. You got a black individual who has a dyspnea. So they do an x-ray and they have multiple uh, metastatic lesions throughout the body. Biopsies done and ran and stated to be malignant melanoma. They'd say, which part of the body would you examine to find the primary disease? And the answer is, under the nails, palms, or sole of the feet. This is called acro, which means 
edge of alpha, no, tip of lentiginous malignant melanoma. This is the most aggressive of all malignant melanomas. So look under nails, palms, soles is where this one is. That has nothing to do with radiation. That's why the black population can get this one. Okay? This is what it looks like in the skin. And actually, you can see why they think Paget's disease of the skin looks very, very similar to malignant melanoma. That look pretty similar. The other type is called nodular malignant melanoma, and, uh, and that's also pretty aggressive, too. The absolute most important thing determining prognosis is the depth of invasion. You don't have to know the Breslow, Wally Clark thing. Just know that depth of invasion is the key to prognosis. Magic number is 0.76. If you're less than 0.76 millimeters, there's no way it's going to metastasize. But if it gets below that, chances increase. So depth of invasion is a, is a key prognostic sign. I happen to like spiders, and so I put that in at the end of the derm notes. And they like spiders too, I might add. So here's your two poisonous spiders. Just to make sure that you get these, I let a couple of them go during the lunch period. So if you've been feeling something kind of crawly, a little itchy on your legs... It's not the person next to you. It's the real thing. Spiders are fascinating creatures. They really, really are. There's a lassoing spider that actually can take silk and lasso an insect. I mean, it's so unbelievable. Spiders. I enjoy them. That doesn't mean I pick them up and kiss them and play with them. No. Now, guys, this is a black widow spider, and that's pretty easy. It is black. Okay. But most people think the red hourglass is on the, on the dorsum. No, it's on the undersurface. So if you want to make sure and the spider is black widow, just pick it up and look on the undersurface to see if the hourglass is there. <laughs> Why do you think it's called black widow? Because when the male mates with her, she eats the male. That, that's the truth. So they do mate cautiously, but for some reason or other, they're going to get eaten anyway. So it seems to be the thing, the old fight between the wasp and the tarantula. Okay, the wasp always beats the tarantula. It's just, I don't know what it is, genetic or whatever. And the same thing, that with black widow, the female always eats the male. What a life. It is a neurotoxin. And it produces, very commonly, spasm of the muscles in the upper thighs and abdomen. So strong, it's almost like tetanus. And sometimes the unwary person might think it's an acute abdomen and do surgery on it. Now, that's really dumb. So it's a neurotoxin that produces um, painful muscle contractions, particularly in the abdomen. There is an antivenom. Uh, for this particular disease, and it is a painful bite. Here's the way they ask it. They say that a person went down into their, into their cellar and lifted up some boxes in the back of the cellar and felt a sharp prick on their finger. Okay, and they say what was that, and then developed over a period of a couple hours, you know, uh, uh, contractions of the muscles in the thigh, and that's a black widow bite. So it is a painful bite. Now, these dudes are a dime a dozen in Oklahoma. This is a brown recluse, otherwise known as a violin spider. And the reason why it's called violin spider, because there's the handle for the violin and there's the violin. And they actually do play this when they're moving around at night hunting, looking for something to bite. And so if you hear some kind of like Bach or something like that, okay, and it's kind of near your ear or possibly on your chest, Okay, it's probably not your radio. It's a brown recluse about ready to envenomate you. And when they do so, it doesn't hurt, actually. But it's a necrotoxin, not a neurotoxin, and it does a real big-time job of producing an ulcer in your skin. Big time. It's the most potent of all venoms in the world. You know, ounce for ounce, the venom of the brown recluse is more potent than a cobra Fair de lance or anything you want to say. For that little size, it packs a, po a pile of stuff. They come out at night, as do most. And I see these all the time in my house. I always thought every now and then I felt something crawl on me, and I'd look, and it wasn't. But then I'd wake up in the morning, there's one on the wall or something like that. They're all over the place. 
So if you leave them alone, they usually you lose, you leave you alone. So neurotoxin for black widow, necrotoxin for brown recluse. Okay, uh, very interesting spiders. I just wanted to show you this. They had a schematic of skin on one person's examination, and it actually had two questions. One said to point to the structure responsible for piloerection. Okay, and so that had to be the erector muscle, the, the, the muscle, and so the answer was this. That produces like, you know, the, when the hair goes up, um, it's this muscle, erector pili. So that was the answer to that. And why that's important, I have no idea. Then the other one dealt with where is the receptor for androgens uh, in the skin. And the answer to that is the sebaceous glands. They have androgen receptors, and that's where um, testosterone or dihydrotestosterone hook into. See, the reason why men more likely get, get zits, get... get uh, 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 pimples, acne, is because we have more testosterone than women. Therefore, we have more that stimulates the sebaceous gland to release that lipid-rich material, which gets into this hair follicle. And then if you have propionobacterium acnei, that's an anaerobe in the skin, it has lipases that break down that fat from the sebaceous gland and produces uh, 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 fatty acids that irritate the follicle, voila, you end up with acne. Acne. So men are more likely to get it because we have more testosterone. So the two areas they seem to be interested in is erector pili, piloerection, and sebaceous glands because that's what the androgen receptors are. Who can tell me the name of the drug that can be used in preventing hirsutism? Very good. Spironolactone, the same drug that you can use to block aldosterone, is excellent for treating hirsutism because it blocks the androgen receptors say that is correct. If that's true, then what other thing can spironolactone do in a male? Gynecomastia, very good, very good. Trevor did a good job. <laughs>